this wonderful institute. Uh, so uh, the talk uh, is going to be about, uh, so is it sufficiently uniform or? Uh, okay. Yeah, it's okay. So the talk will be about anomalies, index theorem, and all that. So a relation about it, guys, uh, their mathematical meaning, uh, their applications to physics. Uh, so I will start actually with index theorems. So index theorems, in, in a sense, as it was introduced, uh, let's say, in the 60s, by I.T. Patori uh, index theorem. So then I will go with anomalies. And so the first anomaly will be chiral anomaly. So actually, we'll consider what is called global chiral anomaly. So it's exactly the index I will derive here. So it's a different name of uh, calling the same object. So that is kind of point of very natural unification between physics and mathematics. Then I will go to an anomaly which is slightly less known uh, in the physics community, which is parity anomaly. So the parity anomaly is not actually related to the index immediately, but it's related to the index for what is called IPS, so Atiyah Patodi Zinger Index Theorem. And this Atiyah Patodi Zinger uh, actually calls you that the index of a certain operator is a kind of a chiral anomaly density plus a parity anomaly. Very impressive theorem, which was derived by Atiyah Patodi and Zinger, uh, something like in the mid-70s, a series of three papers. Uh, and then, well, finally, so I think every speaker is assumed to give something new because this ends up in something like 75, the results from 80, so this is quite old. Well, I will explain you what is called APS, what I call APS theorem for the main walls. So this is a new result. Uh, there was a paper by myself uh, last year in JHEP, and, and so we are preparing another paper which is going to be more mathematical with uh, a PhD student, Sasha Ivanov, uh, from Steklov Institute in St. In San Petersburg. Uh, well, uh, so uh, it's, it's kind of a general talk for everyone. So I will try to uh, actually name the same object in different ways. Uh, so uh, I expect that it will be understandable at least for some of, what, uh, uh, some of you, but if you will see that you don't understand certain phrases, then just assume that they are uh, for the other part of the audience. Uh, maybe that is for no part of the audience, but so uh, I, I don't know. Uh, well, about, about the anomalies. So anomalies is a sound symmetry which is not there. So that, I mean, classical theory has a certain symmetry like a chiral symmetry, but uh, quantum theory, this symmetry is lost. And also classical uh, theory has something like a parity symmetry, uh, symmetry, but in quantum symmetry, it is lost. So these things means actually this is symmetry which is not there. And this is how this is related to this workshop. Uh, so this is quantum symmetry which is not there. So well, I mean, it's kind of a mirror image of, of, of the workshop. So it's not a symmetry which are quantum, but it's a symmetry which, which are absent in the quantum regime. Okay, about the chiral anomaly. Uh, so, uh, kind of a mathematical setup. So, I assume that M so is a compact Riemannian manifold. Uh, well, Riemannian means, so we can just play general relativity here. So, there is a Riemannian metric. And, uh, Compactness is a technical thing. So it's for mathematicians, I have always to explain if it's compact or not. It will not be always uh, needed, uh, but in some cases, yes. And I assume that S, well, is a bundle over M. So being a bundle over M means that I can define function, which I call section of the bundle, which have some kind of, uh, well, continuity, differentiability properties, uh, and you can glue together different, uh, different maps on the manifold. So this bundle I will call, uh, so this gamma of S will be sections of S. And as I told, as it's just a fancy name to call functions uh, on the manifold with uh, values in the fiber. So this kind of, 
I will call them spinners, for they are not going to be actually spinners. I don't need any spin structure on the manifold. Uh, and by the way, since it's Riemannian manifold, this is Euclidean signature. So the metric is positive definite. Uh, now, well, let me also define this d slash, which is called the Dirac operator. And this is just I. In more physically friendly notations, it's like that. So I is square root of minus one. Gamma mu is a Clifford uh, structure of this manifold. So in, in physics, that means that the entire commutator of this gamma matrices is exactly the metric. Twice G menu. So this is Clifford. This is anti commutant uh, matrices such that the square is the metric and they anti commute with each other. And this uh, nabla is, is a covariant derivative. Uh, in more scientific language, so I need kind of, 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 of a principal bundle over this, and I need, a, I need a connection with the principal bundle, so this is associated to this principal bundle uh, and, and the connection there. Covariant derivative. So, in physics, actually, we got used to much more general uh, direct type operators. That means we put here a part of this connection term, also something like mass, like potential, like interaction with the Higgs field. It all can be done in principle for some of the theorems, uh, but not for all. So, I will assume that form of, of the connection. And this connection is such that it is compatible with the Clifford. Structure. So that is nabla with gamma equals to zero. So this is violated if you have some fancy fancy guys like axial vector fields or, or, or whatever. So it contains kind of a Riemannian part. It actually compensates the fact this is gammas do uh, are functions of the coordinate and plus something which you call a Young Mills part. So this actually all things are usually huge matrices. So they have spinor indices in the usual sense, and they have some internal symmetry like a gauge group. So like like whatever you like, any gauge group you can add. And by the way, they also do not need to be spinors. Their objects to these acts, so these sections can be, for example, differential forms. And then this uh, Dirac operator is what is called Hodge Dirac operator. So this is quite a general structure. So dimension of this manifold, let me put it here. Well, which is n, uh, I will mostly suppose that this is even. At least for the beginning, and since it's even, I can introduce what is called the chirality matrix. So there is something which I call gamma star, with the property. So gamma star gamma mu plus gamma mu gamma star equals to zero. So for all of them, uh, so in physical notation, which is what is called in four-dimensional gamma five. Since there is a matrix which anti-commutes the all the matrices, you can derive that uh, yeah, it's almost enough to require that this matrix also anti-commute with the operator D. So in it does that, that means that this matrix uh, which, uh, yeah, I need also another one thing. So the square of the matrix equals to identity. So you can uh, separate the spectrum of this operator into positive and negative eigenvalues of, of this matrix. And since the gamma, square, gamma star squared is identity, this corresponds to values of plus one and minus one. In physics, this is called uh, chirality spinners. So the value plus one, they are called right spinners, and minus one are called left spinners. So operator D moves left spinners to right spinners, and in more fancy language, it's like that. So you take D, 
acting on a shred. And it goes to left spinners and the same operator as left to gamma as right. So that's how the operator acts. Uh, and in fact, uh, you can redefine the restriction. So restriction on the space as right, you can call G right. So this is roughly speaking one half of the matrix you have here. And restriction to the left space, you can call G left. So roughly the operator G is block anti-diagonal. So there is a diagonal which moves right to left and left to right. So this structure is called a complex. So there are two spaces, uh, right and left, left and right, and there are operator right and left that move them uh, to opposite direction, and more of that. Since, uh, well, I didn't tell it, but I assume that this fiber bundle is what is called Hermitian, so there is a, a scalar product on uh, acting on the spinners, and thus you can define something like Hermitian conjugation. So right is a conjugate of the left. So this structure is called a complex, and this complex is what is called elliptic complex. Elliptic, this is because, so the leading symbol, the part of the leading derivatives here is positive definite. So this guy equals to zero only if you act on covariantly constant objects. So this is operator is elliptic. Square of this is a usual Laplacian. And this all allows us to uh, define the index of the operator in a very usual way. So I can define the index of D like the following. So this is dimension of the curl of D right minus dimension of the conjugate operator, like for Fred Holm operators. Kernel of G left. So this is a famous index which gives you a lot of topological characteristics of manifold, which I will explain a bit left, uh, later why is that. So another way to write uh, the index is the following. So uh, as I said, this is the space with positive eigenvalues, if eigenvalues is plus one, and this is the eigenvalue is minus one. So the index also equals to, to the trace of gamma star times exponential of the Dirac operator square. So why this? Uh, this chirality matrix intertwines the spaces with positive and negative eigenvalues. That means that in this sum, all non-zero eigenvalues of D squared appear exactly in pairs. So the contribution of right eigenmodes comes from plus, left with minus, and they have exactly the same eigenvalue here, so they just cancel. So this trace, which is L2 trace, trace of the whole uh, functional space infinite dimensional, becomes a finite dimensional space. That's because this operator is elliptic, so elliptic operators on complex manifold, they have finite number of uh, zero eigenvalues. So this trace is basically the trace on the zero subspace of the manifold with plus minus for right, minus one for left. So this trace simply counts you the number of eigenmodes and subtracts one from the other. So T here can be in principle anything, but you need the convergence. So it has to be a well-defined operator. And to be a well-defined operator, what can it be? So you have I times, times the derivative, so that we have to consider here. Uh, in the Fourier, it's, it's just the momentum times positive matrices. So if you uh, uh, take square of this guy, this is k squared. So this square of the Fourier momentum, 
Thus, for the convergence, you need that this is real and positive. So fine, this is real and positive, but it can be anything. So any value, one half pi, three halves, whatever, actually fits, and, and the index doesn't depend on this parameter t. So this is a very nice characteristics. Uh, that means if t goes to infinity, you are really in a zero space. If t goes to zero, you're in calculable, uh, very nicely defined asymptotics. So uh, how can we compute this? And actually quite easy. So they need what is called the heat kernel expansion. Or in more mathematical literature, it's called the heat trace expansion. So suppose that L is, is some Laplace type operator. Well, Laplace type operator, I mean, that's, that's, it's a second order differential operator, and the highest derivative is just uh, sum of the square of partial derivatives. D1 squared plus D2 squared plus whatever, how it, as many as you have. Uh, if you are in the Riemannian manifold, this D1 squared, of course, means G1, 1, D1, D1. So something like that. So they are contracted with the metric. All sublinear terms can be anything, so I just do not care. Uh, for all that uh, heat trace asymptotics, all what I need is the leading symbol. If a leading symbol is okay, then everything is going to work. And let, so what I'll call Q's, well, little bundle and the morphism, but in more simple things, it's just a, a function which has values in the matrix. Like, well, whatever, scalar function multiplied by the matrix. Well, uh, matrix. You didn't get used to this chop. Value function. Well, what you can do, so you can compute the trace of this operator Q times E minus T L. So this Laplace operator is positive definite, and this is T is positive. This is a compact operator, very nice, trace is convergent, so everything is very good. So this is called the heat trace, of course, I mean, so we have a spectral parameter. It contains the whole information about the whole spectrum of the operator. Clearly, that in general, you cannot even dream about having a uh, closed expression for this. It's very informative. But in asymptotics, then t equals to zero. So there is what is called the heat kernel expansion. So there is a full expansion, meaning that, that it never stops. Uh, so there are coefficients a, k that depend on the operator L and Q, and they are multiplied by the powers of T, depending on the dimension of the manifold, K minus N over two. So what does it mean actually in physics? In physics that means, so using this uh, heat uh, trace representations, so you can regularize your loop integrals. Uh, then t goes to zero, that means that you remove your regularization. So you just consider uh, the vacuum expectation value of certain operator. Uh, and what then happens, uh, so k starts to zero, there are certain powers here, that's minus n over two, minus n minus two over two, that give you divergences. So this is a usual, what is called one loop counter terms. This is divergences of the quantum field theory, and this is just a nice universal way to describe it. Therefore, for physicists, it's not a surprise that all these guys are computable, local, and relatively easy. So that is. Uh, for, in, in mathematics, uh, these nice properties follow from the fact that it's what is called infinitely smooth incorporate. So it is local. Uh, and they are basically known. So for all Laplace type operators, many terms here uh, are written in books. So you can open the book 
come, come from here, and so they're all local meanings, so they are polynomials in the symbol of the operator. Okay, looking at here, you see it doesn't depend on t, so I can take any value of t as I like. I can take, for example, here, the term which corresponds to t equal to zero, so the zero term on the expansion, and so the index of d on a compact manifold without a boundary equals to a n of d squared in this guy. So, and this is local, you can compute them, and this is what is called Pantriagin density. dn x p of x. So this is a famous guy which generates a uh, topological property of the manifolds. This is what in four dimensions will give you uh, instant on, uh, well, instant on charge of your bundle, and so on and so on. And if you have a curved manifold, it will contain something like Riemann curvature squared. And four dimension Riemann curvature, uh, no, in, in no dimension it doesn't contain. But anyway, so it contains in local invariance. If you integrate all the manifold, you get the index. So index, therefore, since these guys are polynomials in, in the symbol of the operator, the index is a homotopy invariant. You can, you can differentiate with respect to them. Polynomials are all continuous. So physicists call this property topological invariant. I mean, you can smoothly vary whatever appears here. And this index cannot change since it's an integer. So this is the Atiyah Zinger index theorem, which was proved in a much more complicated way in the 60s. But actually, it is here. So this is likely. Uh, is it OK? Uh, well, I, I, spent, I spent a lot of time, so I have to actually a little bit hurry up. Uh, now about the anomalies. So what are the anomalies? Uh, from, yeah, let me read this. Well, suppose we have a classical action. So I call this like a Lagrangian. This is dn x psi star d psi. So if you vary this classical action with respect to psi deck, you will have equations of motion. And the equations of motion are like that. So that means classically we are in just in a zero eigenvalue subspace of D. It has a lot of invariances. So clearly you can do a lot of things with just this thing since you don't worry about the high spectrum of D. So the invariances, one of them is what is called global chiral invariance. That means if you take this psi and transform it to the exponential of this chiral matrix times a constant, which is, has a name of a chiral angle. The classical equations of motion, they do not change. Well, obviously. So you have this guy. You simply push it for the Dirac operator, use this property, and you obtain the same equation of motion times some non-degenerate matrix. Yeah, very easy. Well, you have another uh, invariance. Well, this is called parity invariance. Parity is the following. So you take in your Dirac operator all the gamma matrices, gamma mu, and you invert the sign in front of gamma mu. Well, clearly nothing happens since it's a sign in front. So for classical physics, there's no operation. 
it is here. However, in quantum physics, you need what? You need invariance of the whole spectrum. Since so quantum path integral is integration over all eigenvalues of your Dirac operator. So this is violated because it's not a property of the spectrum. And this is also violated since it kind of tells you that the spectrum has to be symmetric. So the spectrum should be, so to keep this invariance in uh, for quantum theory, you need symmetry of the spectrum, which happens sometime. And this happens uh, for all uh, even dimensional manifolds without the boundary, just because uh, the corresponding Clifford algebra has just single uh, equivalent reducible representation. So if you invert the sign of all gamma matrices, you are in the same representation of, of the Clifford algebra as before. So there is no anomaly. Uh, if, however, you are in uh, on odd dimensional manifold, so this flip of the sign, actually, uh, you are getting to, to a different inequivalent representation of the Clifford algebra. And that's why for, uh, uh, for odd dimensional manifold, you have anomaly here. And for even dimensional manifolds, you have anomaly here just because to, to be able to define this chiarity matrix in a non-trivial way, I need even dimensions. So this is even dimensional anomaly here. And this is odd dimension. Well, it makes sense to compute the anomalies. Uh, well, I was planning kind of to explain how to, how to compute them, uh, but I'm running out of time. Uh, so a clean way of doing this is actually quite long. I mean, there is some, some take home way which is called Fujikawa method. Uh, it's very spectacular, but it, it's kind of dangerous, so never, never do it at home. Uh, anyway, I, I'm going to, well, the point is the following. So, uh, uh, the effect of of this transformation actually appears only in the zeros in the spectrum of zero eigenvalues, and you can prove that uh, what is called the one-loop effect effection, which is minus ln determinant of the Dirac operator. Under this chiral transformation, it changes like that. So, variation with respect to theta of this W is proportional. I just don't remember the coefficient. I think it should be one half or something like that. To exactly the same guy. So meaning that your theory on a manifold is not globally quarterly invariant, if and only if the index of the operator is non-zero. So this global chiral invariance or non-invariance is just 100% topological property. Well, clearly, so they here, uh, uh, here the parameter doesn't depend on uh, on the point, so it has to be some global characteristics, but it's not only global, it's also a topological guy. And it lives in all dimensional manifold. So with this, uh, so let's call it chiral anomaly. Well, uh, just again to stress, this is a very physical thing. So that's, uh, if you, instead of uh, global chiral transformations, you can see what is called local chiral transformations. So you say that this angle depends on the coordinate. Still, uh, you will have almost the same expression. So you can compute it in something like 15 minutes. And if you know what you do, from that expression, you can get uh, decay constants of a prime essence just immediately. This computation is like a half an hour you can already compare these two experiments. 
So there was a lot of excitement about, uh, about these things in, let's say, early 80s. So you were able to compare to fresh experimental data, and it was OK. I mean, it, was, it was a really fantastic thing. So anomaly by itself is very, very useful. Uh, and it's universal, it's easy and reliable. So what happens with the parity transformations? Uh, acting a little bit naively, how can we uh, define the parity an uh, anomaly? Yeah, let me delete this. So the parity non variance of the spectrum. So it can be measured like that. So by something like you can sum up the number of positive eigenvalues. So lambda is an eigenvalue. And here you put one. And then you subtract here the negative spectrum. And you put here one. So the number of positive minus the number of negative. So that means it measures your spectrum asymmetry. Of course, what is written here is a nonsense. Since this sum is infinite, this sum is infinite. So the spectrum of an operator is infinite. So instead of this, you measure the spectrum asymmetry by what is called the eta invariant which depends on the operator D and some spectrum parameter. And that is just by definition. Eigenvalues lambda to the power minus S for positive eigenvalues minus for negative eigenvalues This is minus lambda to minus s. So just naively, if s goes to 0, this becomes to 1, and this becomes 1. So it kind of works. And also it kind of works since if s is sufficiently large, if it has sufficiently large real part, this sum is obviously convergent. I mean, the eigenvalues tend to grow, so this sum at large eigenvalues, it's at large number of eigenvalues, they become large. And S is sufficiently large, so both sums are convergent. What is not so obvious, uh, that you can analytically continue this eta function to the whole complex plane as a mere amorphic function. This is a theorem, so it's not so easy. And also it can come to S equals to zero. And then you meromorphically continue this on a whole complex place, plane, you will get, uh, I put, D, the first, zero. So there's a famous eta invariant of manifolds. If you compare this to that guy, so there is no particular reason why it has to be local, and it is not local. So it contains a lot of global information, and it's, in general, it's not computable. So you don't have a closed formula which is so nice that you just put all your uh, data inside this formula, compute the integral, and obtain the eta invariant. It, it doesn't work. It contains important global pieces. There is no analytic formula. But what there is in a formula which I will need, I will have to copy it because I don't remember it by heart. Uh, It's, it's a variation of this anomaly. So I mean, if you take now some small variation, so instead of D, you use D plus some delta D. So you vary a little bit here, uh, let's say, uh, the Young-Mills field. So you take a little bit different connection inside. So you're perfectly allowed to do this. And what will happen to the eta function at the point D? Uh, this is sounding like a nice surprise. So 
So two of the square root of pi is not a nice surprise anyway. But then it's a heat kernel coefficient. This is now local and computable. So this formula is known in mathematics from mid-80s, and it was also reproduced more or less at, this, at, at the same period uh, in, in physics literature by people like Alvarez Gomez in Alice. So if you, uh, let's say, do some model computation with this, let's say you are on a three-dimensional manifold, you have some operator on a three-dimensional manifold, you have a parity anomaly, what is it? This is what is called the chern simons current. And then you like to integrate it to dash, and you will get a chern simons section. So this is kind of a couple of line computation, very easy if you know the coefficients, and you basically know them since they are in textbooks. Well, and now, well, about a Patori zinger index theorem, I still have some time to put what I announced. Uh, so there is a very nice relation between uh, index, as I said here, the global chiral anomaly, which is integral with Pantera intensity, and the parity anomaly on the boundary. And this is from, uh, comes through, through the atf zinger index theory. So this requires a boundary, and since it requires a boundary, it requires boundary conditions. So this is a manifold. Here you have something like a boundary. So you have a Dirac operator defined here, and near the boundary. Uh, so there are operators left and right, is just a derivative with respect to the normal vector plus some other operator. So this is this is laid near the boundary. So the T Patoli Zinger boundary condition look, look, looks looks kind of crazy. So they require the following. Uh, Non-negative. Spectrum. Of. This operator. Which is by the way a Dirac operator. A Dirac type operator on the boundary. Is Dirichlet. So you take all the spectrum of this operator on the boundary. You decompose into, po uh, well, positive, negative, and zero eigenvalues. And you say that all guys that match non-negative eigenfunctions of D, they have to vanish on the boundary. So why that? It's, it's very easy. So let's take this manifold and look here in the infinite cylinder. Then the Dirac operator means normal thing is just eigenvalue of the Dirac operator. So that means that all non-negative spectrum of D does not vanish at this infinity. Okay, so if you like to glue in a cylinder and keep just uh, the spectrum of Dirac operator on this large manifold, which contains normalizable eigenmodes that exponentially decay at infinity, then you have to impose these boundary conditions. So that's the whole idea behind this uh, ugly construction. Then you have to require uh, global boundary conditions. And okay, what you have there, then you have the following. Index of the operator D equals as you respect, expect, so there is a contribution from the bulk, dn or dx, Padragon density in the bulk of the m. But there is a very well defined contribution from the boundary, which is one half of the eta function at zero 
of this new operator d well plus dimension of the kernel of d yeah yeah amazing so this is the index of the, of the operator so this is topological characteristic of the of, of the whole problem so this is what you have uh, like normal index density uh, your young mills field strength times the dual and this is proportional to the parity anomaly of of completely different theory on the boundary so uh that existed for a long time as an amusing formula okay so it's relation between uh apparently non-related things uh but quite recently so in some condensed matter applications it became extremely important. So you have new materials, like you can you can make in a laboratory, you can buy them in the shop, such that uh, in these materials, instead of usual quantum mechanics of textbooks, you have a direct quantum field theory. So what happens here, so this is a theta term, it's, it's, it's an important thing for the boundary, and this is whole conductivity on the boundary, which you can, again, you can go and you can measure. So Hall effect is a famous thing which, which gained a couple of Nobel Prizes. Uh, so it's important to have it. And it's measurable. So conductivity is measured in ohms. You put, you put wires on the surface and you see, well, there is a current which goes in, in a strange direction. Uh, so that was, was a lot of renewed direct, uh, interest to this kind of, of index formulas. But uh, immediately, it's not really applicable, since nothing of this is computable. I, uh, index of D, it's, it's, it's always given by a heat kernel formula, but for that kind of boundary conditions, it's awful. I mean, there are expressions, but they're just horrible. So this is not computable. This is an integral of a very well-defined density, but try to compute integral of well-defined density over some complicated manifold, you fail. So this guy, about this guy, you just know the variation, which is easy. But it also contains some global information. So this function jumps if the variation such that eigenvalue crosses zero. It's not computable. And this dimension of the kernel, well, you have to sit down and it's uh, solve partial differential equation. Well, very nice formula, but unfortunately useless. And a part of that, global boundary conditions are not usual in physics. So you have to analyze the whole boundary, which can be very large, to understand whether the field is Dirichlet or Neumann, which doesn't, doesn't look very nice. So what can you do about this to make it computable and, and more physical? And I think I can just explain the setup of a theorem which we have instead of this. Uh, instead of, yeah, I can sacrifice this. So the problem here is actually, is actually the boundary. So the boundary conditions are so complicated that may make everything non-computable and also not realizable. Uh, if you read the textbooks about the boundary value problems for Dirac operator, you will see that they are all actually not so nice. So uh, there are local boundary conditions, then you can compute everything, but you cannot define the index since there are troubles with uh, the correlative matrix. So the boundary conditions, unfortunately, they cannot do much. But instead of boundaries, you can consider what is called domain walls. Well, suppose you have a manifold, which contains two parts, m plus, m minus. But here, something is going on here, on this interface, which I call sigma. Something is going wrong, but in a very mild way. So how it goes wrong? Uh, Suppose that just d plus 
minus to minus. So these are limits of the connections on the surface from one side and from the other side. So if your coordinate goes from here to the interface surface, you have this covariant derivative. If from here, from the interface surface, you have this covariant derivative. If they are just different. So if there is something vertical B, and this is non-zero. So mild things. On this interface, you have a jump of your gauge connection, actually. So, uh, well, I think everyone knows what is that. It's a high school physics. These are domain walls in a ferromagnet. So usual thing, if you have a ferromagnet, so there is spontaneous magnetization. So it all contains in the domains where you have constant magnetic fields. But on the, uh, uh, so on the intersection, so the domain, this, there are domains magnetic, they meet, there is a jump of a gauge field. This is what happens here. So this is physics which is very easy to realize. Uh, next thing we have to do, we have to define some matching conditions. So since you have discontinuity, you cannot say this is a spectral problem for your operator. It's not defined on the interface. And you have to say what happens then your field crosses uh, this interface. Yeah, you can require many things, but the easiest one is that it just continues. So your psi plus equals to psi minus. That means there is no potential here. So physically, I mean, you don't put electric potential on your, uh, on your device. You can, but you don't need to do this. So what happens? Now let us define the relative eta function. Yeah, I will just copy this. By just integrating this relation and, and, and you just forget that it is not, not correct all the time. I am going to define things by integrating this. This is, uh, so I put this two over square root of pi integral, some parameter s, uh, which is just goes from zero to one. And then you have a n minus two, since the dimension here is n, dimension of boundary n minus one, and this is one minus the dimension, so it's n minus two. Uh, and here is, is how this changes. I mean, so you can make a smooth homotopy, which depends on the parameter s. For s equals zero, you have this operator. For s equal one, you have this operator. So the operators depend on S, and so there is something like uh, D dependent on S and D square. Again, this is the same operator as here. So near the boundary, you can make this decomposition. So this is not difference between the eta invariance. Since this formula is kind of wrong, then your homotopy changes sign of some eigenvalues. But I'm going to use it anyway. So as a definition of some object. And then what we have, we have the following. So the index of D equals to uh, the integral of your Pantragian density. You cannot avoid this. Since you have bulk, you get this minus one half this guy. So the proof of this is, of course, a proof. So we have to work. And it goes, uh, it goes like that. So you, you, you cut it open here, and you put a cylinder of, of a length one. Then this integration of, this, of the parameter of the homotopy becomes integration here in the cylinder you glue inside here. So then you can prove that this guy equals to, oof, well, some integral of a Pantragian density. So this is Kaden Pass technology, which is usual in this part of the business. Uh, well, a lot of technicalities is very natural, but now what we have here. So here, well, this is again, it's of the same level of difficulty. It's integral of a given density. If you can compute, that's good. This is extremely simple. 
So this computation can be done again in no time. Since the expression of these heat canal coefficients are known until n equals to 10, so you can work in dimension 8, which physically you never need. Uh, and computation of this is computation of traces. So nothing here. And by the way, this guy is also very easy. Since instead of complicated boundary conditions, you have simplest matching conditions. So as we did, well, something like 17 years ago with Peter Gilke, you can compute even this guy. So directly. This is computable. This is computable. This is computable. And this is fantastically physical since it's just a ferromagnet. So the model of this is, is yeah, is the most natural you can imagine. Uh, so there are some related works. Uh, just in September, there was a published paper by, by uh, Witten and Unicura, and they just went a different way. So they studied from even dimensional manifold uh, or odd dimensional manifold the field dimensional boundary. So this is quite quite very populated area, studying a relation between anomalies and indices of operators on various manifold. Yeah, and here, well, I think I, I really expect some some real physics in that. So like measuring measuring the conductivity on the interface of various guys. So thank you. Okay, so we have some time for questions for Dimitri. Can you say a little bit more about how you measure this anomaly in a physical experiment? Yeah, in physical experiment, this is going to be a uh, Chern Simons. Uh, so the Chern Simons section, which is, uh, well, it's just contained here. It's not, it's not exhausted by a Chern Simons section. It's something like that. It's 1 over 4 pi. Here comes, uh, well, the Levi Chita. Chita anti-symmetric tensor, which is just one, two, three, and it's anti-symmetrized. One gauge field I D J A K. So this is abelian churn sign. If you take a variation with respect to A, so by, by general physics textbook you obtain a current which is normal to, to, to your A. So this is churn, uh, this is whole conductivity. You have electric field in one direction and, and the current in perpendicular. Uh, to measure this, you, you have to go into the interface. You put actually four, uh, four points, uh, so you take, you know, measure current as, as a function of, uh, of your electric field. It's, it's the problem, it's actually very tiny. So it's, uh, it's quantum effect, so it's proportional to fine structure constant. It's, it's not so easy to measure, but it's a principle though. It's just the abelian you can measure? Is there some non-abelian terms? Yeah, in abelian field, it's, well, in abelian field, you add here, you put a trace outside, you add a triple term. Uh, is there so. some example of non-abelian churn simons in nature? That you yes, know? yeah, yeah, yeah. It's non-abelian churn simons. It's this term plus two-thirds of A, I, A, J, A, K. So what's the gauge group? What group Whatever. are you talking about? Sorry? Whatever. So those, uh, no, the, in, most in, famous, in the, the most world. famous guy is SU2. Uh, Chern Simons, uh, which you use in conformal field theory. It's it's like in, in this link invariance, it's is that. I'm just asking. What's so non-abelian would be like that. It's an integral. No, I know the non-abelian. I'm just asking, what's the physics experiment to measure the non-abelian? That's what uh, I'm non-abelian. No, no, I non-abelian. It's it's also this physics, but it's it's distant from me. Is it? Uh, you have hot hadron uh, matter, and it's it's on bounded manifolds, and it's with interfaces. So then you have heavy ion collisions for very short period of time. You have a mixture of everything, and there you have domain walls and you have boundaries. But I cannot say anything about it because the physics is is kind of unusual since it exists uh, for about the same time that light needs to to cross this this compass. Yeah. Any further questions for Dimitri? Yes. Um, could you say something about elliptic genus and how it fits here? A oh, good question. Uh, I would actually prefer to, to, to ask this question to someone. I am interested in <laughs> Well, uh, no, I cannot. I mean, so that's, uh, can you? The answer is I cannot. I, I discussed it with my students who is doing this 
one of my former students who is doing that, but yeah, it didn't come too far. Okay. Further questions? So if not, let's thank Dimitri again for the colloquium. <laughs> yeah. And uh, th there should be some refreshments uh, upstairs in the mezzanine. Thank you. Thank you.